praise the Lord. Um, thank you all so much just for making us um, feel so welcome. Um, me and my wife and family, we really appreciate it. Um, we've been sort of meeting in terms of a, a, a building for about the same times as yourselves. Um, it'll be our 10th anniversary this year um, for Bethesda Shalom, and so we're thanking God. And we understand how it works, you know, grassroots work, um, no blueprint, and um, very much as young believers, sort of, we, we never had people in our lives that we could look up to, as Paul said, follow me as much as I follow Christ. And we've just had to seek God and just plough a, uh, you know, a straight furrow through. And it's not been easy, you know, times of disappointment, times of isolation. And so we just truly value just meeting and Brother Keith and to know that you all are praying for us. And we as a fellowship are praying for you very close to our hearts, along with other fellowships, the lifeboats up in the north of Ireland and Brother Stephen. So we just thank you for, for the connections that God is bringing together. It means so much to us. And if I wasn't preaching um, this weekend, just coming here and just being a part of the family of God um, would be, you know, um, a tremendous blessing um, to myself. So thank you again just for, for welcoming us and the invite, um, Brother Keith. You know, I tremendously um, value what God is doing here, esteem what God is doing here, and just be encouraged to keep going and pressing on. Um, it's lovely to see the young brothers coming up as well. And all that God is doing here, it's just I thank him for it. Praise God. Amen. If you wouldn't mind turning then, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. It's going to be another um, heart-searching message. Um, and that's because these are things that God has been speaking to my own heart about. I seek to preach... Um, things that are a reality to myself. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to read from verse 14 down to chapter 7 and verse 1. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. <coughs> Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Amen. And so, Father, I just come before you again now, Lord. We come before you as a church, and we recognize now our absolute need, Father, for your help this afternoon I need help to preach, Father. We need help to listen, to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And we count the heart-searching work of the Spirit of God of tremendous importance, Father. We count it a privilege to be able to hear your voice, Father, to be able to have our hearts probed in the way that you do. And we know that you are a God full of compassion, long-suffering and mercy, and Lord, it is not your heart to trip us up, but that we might be drawn the nearer to you. And so I ask, Lord, I stand in the place of need, we all do now, and ask for your help, Father. Keep us alert, keep us awake, Father, and speak to us, we pray now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I've titled this sermon, Ironing Out the Creases. Ironing Out the creases. On June the 6th, 1882, 
Henry W. Seeley of New York City received a patent for the first electric flat iron. It weighed almost seven kilograms, took forever to heat up and cooled down in no time at all. And as you can imagine, it wasn't much of a commercial success, but the ball had been set in motion for what the next century would, sh would shape, or sorry, it, the ball had been set in motion for what in the next century would shape the future of corded electric um, steam irons. Before the invention of electricity, um, from the 17th century through to the 19th century, if one wanted to iron the creases out of their garments, one would take a triangular lump of cast iron with a handle, heat it on a stove or in the fire, and that would be your iron. Alternatively, you could make use of what was called a box iron, same triangular shape, made of the same cast iron, but the bottom of it was hollow, which allowed for it to be filled with red hot charcoal. I mean, can you imagine ironing your clothes um, with that, with steam coming out? Now, I understand ironing clothes has never been on the top list of one's priorities. It's never really been one of, um, or one of our favorite pastimes. It is, after all, a chore. But as with most chores, the job is necessary. What would you think if in the midst of preaching, Brother Keith was to cast off his suit jacket in his customary manner to reveal a shirt with a thousand creases? I don't know what you, who would be more embarrassed, whether Brother Keith would be more embarrassed um, or you. I thank God he's got a good iron at home. Now, as a man, I have to confess that I'm not as thorough as my wife. Uh, when it comes to ironing, I mean, I don't want to put on a bag of rags, but at the same time, I don't want to take 20 minutes to iron one shirt. Okay, it might have a stubborn crease here and there, but it's not the end of the world. No one's really going to see it, are they? And by the time I've put my jacket on, well, you'd never know it was there. Now, some of you know what I'm speaking about in more ways than one. I'll see a crease in the shirt and I'll just run the iron back and forth a few times. My wife, on the other hand, the steam billowing, sprays going. She's ironing, she's, she's you know, paying the attention that's required. And all of that just to remove one crease. Is it really that necessary, I think? And she'll tell me, absolutely. Yeah. You see, the end of the game, the outcome is pink. I'm wondering, is that your end game, Christian, this afternoon, pink? To be conformed as closely as possibly to the character and likeness of Jesus Christ. To be as holy as God could possibly make you. Or are you content to live with a few creases here and there? The coat will cover it, you say. But when I read this book, I see that I've been purchased with royal blood. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. That he, that's Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it. That's the church, you and I. With the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And the emphasis this afternoon is not having spot. The emphasis this afternoon that it should be holy and without blemish. No one's arguing that the shirt needs to be ironed. It does. I'm talking about the finer details of those stubborn creases. Are we prepared to put the work in, the time and the effort, the diligence to ensure that every crease is pressed out? In the natural speaking, when it comes to ironing, I've already told you, as long as it's got the majority of the creases out, I'm good to go. But friends, to bring that attitude into our Christian experience is deadly. 
It's to settle for that which God says we shouldn't settle for. It's to make allowances when God says here in his word that Christ might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. I fear, brothers and sisters, that if we're honest with ourselves and if we're honest with God, we make allowances in our, in our Christian lives for things that God says clearly ought not to be there. I'll say that again, that if we're brutally honest before God and before man, we can make and do make allowances in our Christian lives for things which God says should never be there. Try bringing a lamb to the altar under the old covenant to make sacrifice when that lamb has a broken leg. Do you think that God would have accepted it? Well, what does the law say? It's not down to our opinion. What does God say? Old covenant, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 1. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep, wherein is blemish or evil favouredness. That means some kind of deformity or ugliness. For that is an abomination unto the Lord. So to pick one of those lambs out of the flock with a blemish, a spot on it, to us, well, it's just a minor defect, but to God says it's an abomination to offer this sacrifice unto God because he requires a lamb without blemish, without spot, and a lamb without wrinkle. That's strong language. In Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 21, and if there be any blemish therein, as if it be lame, or blind, or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 15 and verse 21. In Leviticus 22 and 24, Leviticus 22 verses 24, Ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised, or crushed, or broken, or cut. If there's even a cut on the sacrificial victim, God says don't offer it. Neither shall ye make any offering thereof in your land. See how seriously God considers this. And yet we excuse our wrinkles, our spots. We make allowances. We cover them over with grace. And you say, Brother Paul, but that's old covenant. We're new covenant believers now. But I say, Brother, this is new covenant also. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, were well, what things? The new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. In verse 13 before it, Peter says, be diligent. Make every effort, that means. Diligence means make every effort. That ye may be found of him in peace, in good conscience, without spot, that's without stain. And blameless, that means without fault. Now that's not the words of this preacher. These are the words of Peter. This is the word of God. This is God's heart, God's mind being revealed to you and I. And Peter says, seeing that you look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein is going to dwell righteousness, make every effort on your part, Christian, that you might be found when he comes of him in peace, having good consciences towards God, without spot and blameless. What was written under the law is also written under grace. And I asked this afternoon, was Peter wasting his time? 
Was he wasting ink when he wrote what he wrote? Is Peter playing games with us? Trying to set up a standard that's artificial, that he knows full well we're never going to attain unto it? Is Peter putting forth a notion that he knows is an impossibility? But I mean, well, it looks good on paper. Is that what he's doing or did he intend for that which was written not only to be reached, attained to, but also to be put into practice? And I'll go with the latter, that I believe it's the heart of God that he reveals these things to us because he would have us to strive after greater excellence than at times we're prepared to do. Now look, this isn't some obscure, isolated verse hidden away in the margin of our Bible somewhere. This is New Testament Christianity. And the problem with the church today is that it's closed the book and it's going by opinion. But if you open the book and you look at the scripture, we're not talking about a few isolated verses open to any epistle you like in general. And you're going to see emblazoned across it these same sentiments that God desires a people who are holy. That's the heartbeat of the New Testament. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 15 and 16 these famous words. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in some manner of conduct. No, in all manner of conversation, conduct. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's 1 Peter 1 verses 15 and 16. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13, we read these words. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love towards one another and towards all men, even as we do towards you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. To the end, that God might establish our hearts unblameable in holiness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 1. And I ask you this afternoon in light of the seriousness of these commandments, in light of the seriousness of these exhortations. Why is it that so many who profess to know the Lord live so miserably below the standard of what they have been called to walk in? It's a question. We've been called to a tremendously high standard. But as I look in the church today, I see the church living way below that standard. I mean, it's just really a slight step up from the world. Why? That's my question. And in a single word, I return to you the answer, complacency. Now, granted, ignorance might be a reason. They've just never heard the standard put to them. But complacency plagues the church of Jesus Christ. We know how we should be living but we're complacent to live in the place we presently are. We, seek, we cease to keep striving after excellence, and well, we just make allowances and settle down when God would have us to aim higher. In other words, we're satisfied with the holiness that we have already obtained. Let that sink in. We're content. We've drawn a line and we've said, I've come this far and I'm happy where I am. I mean, I'm not getting drunk and I'm not fornicating and lying. And so I'm happy where I am. We're satisfied with the holiness already obtained. We reason that we're not taking drugs and we're not going out to nightclubs, dancing the night away in some backstreet club. 
As I said, we're not liars and thieves and fornicators and drunks. We go to church on a Sunday. We attend the Friday prayer meeting. And thus, we're content to live with a few creases here and there. But answer me this. If the King of England was to turn up for dinner this afternoon, would you serve him a dinner, his dinner, on a smash plate? Well, how about a chipped one? I mean, it's not smashed. Just, just a minor imperfection here. It's not that bad. I mean, we can cover it over with the peas or something. But you see my point? We wouldn't. That chip on that plate would disqualify it for service. And we'd search the cupboards to find a plate that's unblemished because we would count it an insult to offer the king such things. Well, how about this king? How about King Jesus? Are we happy to offer to him our chips, our dents, our blemishes and excuse it? Well, it's just not that bad. If you look in Malachi chapter 1, we're going again to the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1. Verse 6. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you. O priests that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Treating the sacrifices of God as just a, well, a minor insignificance, offering to God polluted things upon the altar. And ye offer the blind for sacrifice, and if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with you? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? God had a controversy with his priests. They said, well, in what way do we pollute? You, Lord, in what way have we defiled thine holy place? And God says, by offering to me that which is sick and that which is lame, when I call for an unblemished sacrifice. And brothers and sisters, are we not a royal priesthood? Priests of the Most High God, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation? a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Have we not been appointed to make sacrifices unto God? And you say, well, Brother Paul, with, with what sacrifice shall we bring our worship to God? Well, you know the verse in Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, or as one translation puts it, which is your spiritual worship, that our very lives are an offering unto God, 
that the God who sits in the heavens receives the sacrifice of praise from his people and it's our living vessels offered up to God as a holy offering without blemish, holy and unacceptable, acceptable unto God. I want to say that holiness is non-negotiable. It's not optional for the Christian. It's non-negotiable. It's the sovereign work of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to sanctify a people holy unto the Lord. That's his sacred office, to sanctify a people, to separate a people unto himself, to work in our lives, to work in our hearts, so that we might present ourselves vessels of service unto the Lord. Hear the exhortation which speaks to us this afternoon as sons and daughters in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 21 through to 23 or to 24. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means sanctify means to make you holy. Holy with a WH, sanctify you entirely, not a part. Well, have my left hand sanctified, but my right hand is unsanctified? No. The Spirit of God comes to sanctify us entirely, the whole of us, our mind, our attitudes, our hearts, our outlooks. The Spirit of God has not come that he might sanctify us in part. We park there in part. But God would say to each one of us this afternoon, myself included, but I want to take you higher. I want to take you higher. And can I submit that it's not God putting on the brakes, it's we who put on the brakes because we're content to settle on the ground of holiness we've already come to and we say, well, we're happy here. God wants to take us higher. The very God of peace sanctify you holy and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. I love that. God's faithful, the one that called us to perform it, to do it in us. Sanctification is an ongoing process where we're being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And I acknowledge that I'm not there yet. And I say, but Lord, take me on. Take me higher, year on year, month on month. Take me higher, Lord. So that 30 years down the road, I look back and I say, thank God, whilst I might not be how I ought to be yet, I'm not what I was. Onward movement and upward progression. I fear that the bar of holiness has been set so deplorably low in the modern evangelical church today that if a man is not cussing and sleeping around, he's counted a man of God's. I'm sad to say holiness for the 21st century Christian is only one step up from the life that they used to live before before they knew the Lord. But is that what the New Testament scriptures say? God had to deal with me and my wife on this as young believers because we were in a climate where sort of sin was excused. You know, well, it doesn't really matter. God understands. He's a God of grace. He covers it. Don't worry too much. And if you dwell in an environment like that for too long, then you just begin to be leavened. Rounded, comfortable, compromised. And God really convicted us and allowed us 
over a period of time to get into the New Testament and man, God really began to deal with our lives. That the things we were making excuse for, God did not make excuse for. And the word was repent to our hearts. Stop making excuses. In Ephesians chapter 4, if you turn there, please, I just want to bring to you the standard of the New Testament. This isn't my personal touch on it. This isn't sort of like the preacher's slant. This is the word of God. I'll just read it to you straight. Out of the King James Bible, I'll just read it to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. We could stop right there. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. In other words, they've got no excuse or they have an excuse, sorry, they're alienated from the life of God, they're unregenerate, they're dead in sins and trespasses, sinners do what sinners do, they sin through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, that's lust, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but... Ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, the regenerate man, the man created in the image of Christ in true righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed, unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the New Testament. That I, if I am redeemed and regenerate by the Spirit of God, then I'm to live differently to how I used to before I knew the Lord, when I was alienated from the life of God, when I was blind and dead in sins and trespasses. Now that mine eyes have been opened and my heart has been regenerate, I'm to live a different way now. Are we still tempted in sin? Absolutely. But Paul says, put off the old man. In other words, I've been given power to have self-control over these members. That what the lustful eye might want to gaze at, I'm to check it through the Spirit of God in me and say no. To discipline myself so that I'm able to present these members now as instruments of righteousness pleasing unto the Lord. That's my call of duty. This is the New Testament standards. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. In verse 1 of chapter 5. Walk in love. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. But listen. Fornication. 
That's um, intimacy outside of marriage. All uncleanness. This covers the catalogue of sin. So we could put pornography right in there. Covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. That's the standard of the New Testament. But I was told, well, well, don't worry about it. It's not that big a deal. We all stumble. We all fall. Don't worry about it. But I want to say there's a difference between stumbling and premeditated stumbling. There's all the difference in the world. I've got a car insurance, but if I took my car and drove it into a wall on purpose and then rang up the insurance company, they're not going to be paying out. I broke the terms and conditions of the contract. It's there for accidental damage and not there to be abused. And there's multitudes of Christians today abusing the grace of God, making excuse for all manner of things that God says is an abomination to him. And the word is repent. That's the word today for the church at large. Paul here says, let not these things once be named among you as is fitting or becometh the saints. And he goes on, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, and he makes it absolutely clear. And whatever side of the fence you might be on, on the issue of eternal security and the like, you can't argue with the word of God. For this ye know that no whoremonger, who's Paul writing to, is writing to the church. No whoremonger, someone who sleeps around, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And in case we didn't get it, in verse 6 he goes on to say, Let no man deceive you with vain words. Let no one deceive you. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And look, for ye were sometimes darkness, past life, pre-Christ, sometimes in darkness, but now, in Christ today, now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. This isn't my opinion. This is the word of God to New Testament believers, and yet we do not hear this preached generally across our land today. We don't. Preachers are afraid to even mention sin for fear lest they empty the churches. But any man of God worth their salt has to open the book and preach as the prophets of old, repent and return back unto the Lord. Well, where do we go from here? We can go left, we can go right. Well, let's just go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll head left and then we'll go back right. I could spend so long giving you verses after verses, but for time's sake, we'll just look at two more passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. And this isn't pie-in-the-sky thinking. This is the word of God. This is the standard. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. It's there again. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, speaking about the practice of homosexuality, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And I love this. And such were some 
of you. Past tense. Not such awesome of you. That's what the modern church says. No, such were some of you. Past life. This is what you did. This is how you conducted yourselves. But what? Ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This is the power of the gospel to change a life, to come where there's darkness and to bring light, to come where there's death and ruin and to bring life and hope. This is the glorious gospel. And Paul spoke of a church, the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, and he says that you don't need for us to advertise you. Your own lives are an advertisement. For the world is speaking how the Thessalonians turned from idols to serve the living gods. We think Ireland is bad. Try Corinth, try Ephesus. When Paul went into these sin dens, where all their lives had served these filthy idols with abominable practices, degrading immorality. And we see that the gospel of light came and took hardened sinners and turned them into saints. This is the power of God. But we've blunted the message today. We've lowered the bar and we just allow anything to flow now and just cover it all with a blanket of grace. And soon enough, Jesus is going to get us out of here. This is the sad and sorry state of Christianity today. But as I open the book, brothers and sisters, we've got to recover again as Josiah did in his day. When the law of God lay buried and the priests came and told him we found the book and we're in trouble. We're in trouble. The wrath of God's upon us. And we see that that king humbled himself and repented. And God had mercy upon him in his generation, though we see that judgment eventually did come. And that's what we need to do, friends. We need to recover again the truth of God's word, of the holy standard, and to again set our pitch towards it. Let's go right now to Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what God says. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people that look different from the world, as different as darkness is from light, as black is from white, to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I could keep going, friends. Examples abound, testifying to the same. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. I want to ask, are you walking in holiness this afternoon? Or even now as you sit under the sound of my voice, do you have to confess with head bowed low that I've strayed from the highway of holiness? I'm doing things, preacher, that I know I shouldn't be doing. Looking at things that I know grieve the heart of God's going to places which I know no Christian 
No saved man or woman should be going. Hear the exhortation and the admonition of the Lord today as we turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You see, when you look in the letters and the epistles, we see that light came in and lives were gloriously changed. But then Paul has to go back over old ground and reinforce the standard because he knows we can drift. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, where we began. Be not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the heart of God. Holiness to the Lord. The high priest under the old covenant, attached to his mitre, to his turban on a golden plate, inscribed with the words, holiness to the Lord. Is that inscribed across your heart? Is it inscribed across my heart? That we have nothing any longer in common with this world. As light hath no common with darkness, as righteousness hath no in common with unrighteousness, so a mighty gulf doth separate us from what we used to be, from who we are now in Christ. Holiness. Having put forth a series of rhetorical questions, the answer to each of these is nothing. And Paul's addressing the Corinthians here who were running the risk really of just amalgamating back in, into the places where they once were a part of. They ran the risk of moving again back into idolatry, feasting with the idolaters, communicating and having fellowship with the old company, returning back to the old ways. And Paul tells them, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he asks these series of rhetorical questions, and the answer to each of them is nothing. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is nothing. What communion, what common sharing hath light with darkness? The answer is nothing. What agreement, what concord, what union hath Christ with Belial, Christ with an idol? The answer is nothing. Or what part hath he that believeth with an unbeliever, an infidel? Nothing. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And again, the answer is nothing. And so Paul here brings forth the conclusion. And he says, you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the conclusion that he comes to is this. Wherefore, if that be so, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Where is the room left us for mixture? Where the shadow of grey, it's taken away from us. And we're left with that which merely contrasts white and black, light and darkness, righteousness and unrighteousness. Be ye holy is a call to separation. 
Be ye holy is a call to be ye separate. Oh, we live in the world, I understand that. Jesus said, you're in the world. But then he qualified it by saying, but you're not of the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're pilgrims, strangers, passing through. And we're called to a life of separation from everything that defiles, from that which would soil our testimony, from that which would blot our white robes. We're called to separate from in order that we might be a consecrated people unto God, a vessel, a vessel in which a holy God can indwell. You say, Brother Paul, is this optional? And I'm closing shortly. Well, see the condition upon which God promises to receive him to ourselves, to himself. There's conditions here. He promises to be a father to us and for us to be his sons and daughters. But look in verse 17. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There's a condition there. There's a condition. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And how radically different is this message from what is being presented today in the modern evangelical church? The church in our day says, live as you like, and Jesus is obligated to receive you as you are. But that's not what I'm reading here. I stress again, there's a condition. Wherefore, in verse 17, come out. We are the temple of the living God. These bodies are temples in which the Spirit of God indwells. God said, I will walk in them. They will be, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so he calls us to come out, to separate from that which is unclean. Don't touch it. Don't be defiled by the world. And Jesus or Paul here says, God says, I will receive you. Will be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's a condition. Now, for all the good of chapter divisions in our modern Bibles, this is one example where the division could have been made better on the part of man. Well, what do I mean? Well, as one reads the context of the passage, one discovers that verse 1 of chapter 7 is still part of Paul's argument in chapter 6. So we end it in verse 18 and close the book, but we need to read on to verse 1 of chapter 7 because we, are, we have here presented Paul's final exhortation to the Corinthian church in this matter of fleeing from idolatry. And so let us read verse 1 of chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having these promises that have just come before it. Receiving us as sons and daughters. Him being a father to us. We being temples of the Holy Spirit. God walking and living and moving within us. Having therefore these promises. Dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. That's incumbent upon us. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And here it is, my point this afternoon. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The Amplified Translation puts it this way. Therefore, since these great promises are ours, beloved, 
let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit and bring our consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, let that burn into your hearts, the holy obligation upon us. We can't do it in our own strength, no one's saying that, but if we be regenerate, then we have the Spirit of God in us and the power and the means by which to put out those things that are unclean. That's what the text is saying. Since these great promises are ours, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit and bring our consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of God. In one sense, holiness is something to be experienced now. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. That's a command for now. That is what we are to do. Where the Lord shines a spotlight of sin in our lives, we're not to make peace with it. We're not to excuse it. We're to flee from it. We're to acknowledge, God, you're right. And the thing that you're convicting me about, you're spot on, Lord. And God, I've allowed this. I've made compromise in my life. And I'm putting it out. I'm repenting of it, Lord. You say, is it that easy? Friends, it's that easy. It's a choice of the will. It's the committal of our hearts. It's called obedience. Whereby we're willing to walk as God would shine the light in our lives. In one sense, holiness is something to be experienced now. But in another sense, holiness is progressive. It's an ongoing process whereby we are striving after nothing less than perfection. That's the point that I want to drive home as I close this afternoon. Ironing out the creases. Thank God the shirt is ironed, but there's still stubborn creases that need extra effort in ironing out. You understand what I mean? Perfecting holiness in the fear, in the fear of God. It's my heart's burden to exhort you not to make peace with those creases. Don't settle for them in your life. Iron them out. Those irritable ways, the tendency to criticize others, well, it's just a slight of speech. No, it's gossip. That selfish streak. The subtle attitude of self-righteousness. A sideward glance here and there of lust. You know you and I know me. And as the Holy Spirit shines light on these areas of darkness, we're to be zealous in applying the steam and getting the creases out. I understand that some of those creases are stubborn. Tell me about it. I understand. But to make peace with them, friends, is simply to allow them to live. It's to do a soul job. When God said, destroy the Amalekites, and he spared king, the king Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Samuel said, you've spared that which God said you ought not to spare. And Samuel, we're told, took out his, his sword and he hewed him to pieces. And that is the attitude that we are to have as God shines light in our lives and reveals those stubborn stains or those stubborn creases. We're to be diligent to iron them out. Can I say this afternoon as I close, brothers and sisters, don't be content where you are. Don't. I say that to myself. Don't be content. Don't make peace with those things that God is putting his finger on. Don't put the brakes on. Don't be complacent when the Spirit of God is trying to get your attention. He's speaking for a reason. 
because he desires to make us more holy. A sacrifice, a living sacrifice, offered without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle to God. That's the heartbeat of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Is that your heart this evening? Is that the burden of your soul? That, Lord, there's still work yet to be done. Lord, I'm not complacent where I'm at. I'm not pleased even though I attend Limerick City Church and sit under the ministry of Brother Keith. Lord, I'm not content because you know and I know there's things in my life that you're asking me to deal with, God. And I can't just wave the flag of grace and say grace will cover it. God is speaking and he's calling us up to higher ground. He desires to have a people that are pure, spotless in this generation. Let us close with Hebrews chapter 12. I finish with this. Verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. May these words be our heart, these sentiments, our heart's burden, the desire to run on, the desire to press forward, the desire to reach yet for higher ground. One preacher said that you're as holy as you want to be, and it's so true. I can never look at my life and say, well, Lord, I've arrived and leave things there. I'm as holy as I want to be. God would take us higher. Would we yield this afternoon? Come on, some of you. God's been dealing with you about things in your life that he sees. Little things that were you to stand up this afternoon and to share them in the congregation, we'd say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, it's not murder. You're not lying. You're not stealing. I remember just the other week of a meeting where a pastor came under tremendous conviction of God and stood and wept before the congregation, trembling, broken, over a matter that generally the masses would say, well, what's the big deal? But God had his finger on his life. And God was saying it's unacceptable. Just a little spot. Just a little cut. Just a little blemish. It's only a broken leg. God says it's an abomination to take that and to offer it unto him. And in times of revival and on, we're praying for revival. Things which ordinarily would have been counted as insignificant when the Spirit of God comes, suddenly they become significant. And we break in the presence of God as we see that we've been allowing things in our life that God says we shouldn't make allowance for. God would have us to aim higher. And so let us just be honest with God now and talk to him in the quietness of our hearts. God's been dealing with me. I shared a few things with Brother Keith. Things that you might say, well, look, it's not that big a deal, but it is because God desires holiness. And he's been dealing with this preacher and speaking to things in my heart and saying, 
Son, it's unacceptable now. Come on. You need to move past this. You need to move on from this to higher ground. What's God saying to your heart? Give him glory this afternoon and say, Lord, you're right. Stop making excuses. Well, Lord, it's just I'm shy or, well, Lord, it's just, no, it's pride. We can excuse things that God says we should not. Let's deal honestly with God now. And let's say, Lord, firstly, you're right. I'm willing, the first and necessary step, I'm willing to acknowledge my transgressions. Secondly, Lord, I'm willing to confess, to agree with you and say, Lord, you're right. And Lord, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. And then thirdly, we're willing then to turn from them, to forsake them and say, Lord, I'm done with it. You say, is that possible? It's possible. It is possible for God to break the back on sin, whatever it is. So that you can say, I'm done with this thing. And Lord, no more. No more. No more looking in the wrong direction. No more thinking these thoughts when I know that they're harmful thoughts. They're things I shouldn't be thinking. No more, Lord. Enough. Is there one this evening, this afternoon, that would respond in the quietness of their heart? And here and now, just... Get alone with God and say, Lord, you're right. And so, Father, I thank you. Lord, I've sought as best I can with your help this afternoon to bring that which you placed upon my heart. That, Lord, which, Father, you're speaking to me about and dealing with me about. Oh, Father, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we excuse, Lord. Well, I'm just tired. I'm irritable. Oh, God, deal with us, please. Deal with our characters. Deal with our inward man, we pray. Root out, Lord. Highlight, shine light, Father. Deal with us, oh, God, please. We're not content where we are, Lord. We don't want to be a complacent people. We don't want to excuse that for which the blood of Christ has and was shed to cleanse us from, to deliver us from. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken to our hearts and we want now to make the proper response. We want now, Lord, to bend, Father, Bend, Lord, in your presence. Oh, God, we want to glorify you and honor you, Lord. We want to say, forgive us, Father, that these vessels, Lord, wherein dwelleth the Spirit of God, Father, we've defiled them, Lord. Defiled them, Father. Cleanse us, forgive us, purge us, renew us, restore in us again, Father. Purify a people unto thyself from amongst this assembly, Father. Oh, we pray, Father, help us, Lord. Deal with us, Father, please. Lord, help us to break free from those shackles, those chains of bondage today. I pray they'd be smashed, Father. I pray they'd be destroyed, Lord. Christ, you didn't come to merely forgive us of our sins. You came to deliver us from the power of sin, Lord. To make a people purified unto thyself. Dear God, deal with us now, we pray. Go deep, Lord. We're not digging in the dirt, but things that you have your finger on. Things that you're speaking to us about, Lord. We want to come clean this afternoon. We want to say, forgive us, Lord. We've compromised. Forgive us, Lord. We've, we, we, we've become complacent, content to live with the creases. When, Lord, you would have us to deal and to iron them out. God, hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.